Coming up on Tech News Today, Pandora. Should they be called Panhora? Also, Hulu gets arty with the Criterion Collection. Apple might be headed for an antitrust suit. And Dell might be buying AMD. It's crazy talk today. You got to watch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, February 15th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle the used gadgets lying around your home or office. For a 5% bonus payment for your used gadgets, go to gazelle.com. Use the bonus code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day, try to make some sense of it. And we brought one of the most sensible people I know along Mm -hmm. to help today, uh, CEO of Revision3.com, Mr. Jim Louderback. How's it going, Jim? It's going good, thanks. It's good to be here, too. Are you feeling sensible? Uh, I feel like I've got my wits about me. Good. <laughs> That's handy. You look sensible. You're dressed sensibly. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you You've have got sensible a headset shoes on. on. Audio sounds sensible. <laughs> All right. Let's feeling. go for it. Let's be sensible. Have you been? I've got uh, sensible shoes on too. Look. Good. Oh, excellent. Those are well. Yeah, those are fairly. Oh, sensible. those are very good. sensible. Good for yeah. hiking mm-hmm. and urban wear. Definitely. Yep. And I am in a urban environment, so that's a good thing. <laughs> Mobile World Congress going on. We had a lot of announcements we talked about yesterday. HTC saved theirs for early this morning uh, and announced oh, uh, three main groupings of announcements. First, the HTC Flyer, a 7-inch tablet with a super LCD screen, 1024 by 600 resolution, aluminum unibody. Pretty pretty stacked inside. 1.5 gigahertz Qualcomm processor, 1 gigabyte of RAM, 32 gigabytes of storage, run an Android 2.4 gingerbread. That's the gingerbread for tablets. Uh, they are doing Sense UI, a Sense UI that's optimized for tablet. And the cool thing is the pressure-sensitive capacitive stylus. Jim, pen computing is back. You know what I think? I, you know, styluses, do you remember the old Windows computer? I still have one, the Windows tablet oh, yeah. with the special stylus. You'd lose those styluses. It was all over. I am so happy that we don't need styluses on most of our tablets. So thank God you don't need one for this. I predict that that stylus will almost never be used and people are going to lose it within the first two weeks. They're calling it the HTC Scribe technology. Uh, and it uh, is a, uh, is a I, I think it's a capacitive pen. Is it not? Uh, but they, yeah, they they did a little uh, demonstration of it. It shows that it's it's much better than the uh, the pens that we're used to, or the pens that have been made up for things like the iPads. It's it's got a, a piece of software designed to allow you to to write with it. I just don't know if anybody's going to make any use of it. Well, it's nice that it's an option. It, this is the controversial seven inch tablet, though. You know, LG yesterday said they're just big smartphones, and we all know how Steve Jobs feels about the smaller form tablet. Well, what's, what's nifty about this is if it's for note-taking, 7 inches seems b- like a better form factor than a big old 10-inch. And you, can it does, kind of, you can literally palm it. Yeah, and, the, and it does have the ability to record audio in a meeting and sync it with your note-taking. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know what? I use this program called, uh, it's on, on Office, and it's OneNote, and it's great. And I take notes in it all the time. I type on it. It has the ability to record, too. But you know what? Those recordings never really work out too well. And so... I like the concept of recording while you take notes, but you know, in the end, you're not really going to use it that much. I, I do think taking notes is okay, but but that stylus, you're going to lose it. And then if you've got to have a stylus, a special stylus, it's going to be a problem. I know I would lose that stylus. You're absolutely right. I would right. too. Yeah. I would lose it within three days of buying it. HTC also announced some Facebook phones, although Mark Zuckerberg would like me not to call them that. We'll get to that later. Uh, okay. The HTC Salsa and the cha-cha. <laughs> because they like to say salsa. Somebody likes Mexican food. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> they come with Android 2.3, Gingerbread, a uh, Sense UI that has been optimized for Facebook integration. Uh, both phones have a Facebook button, which pulses blue when there's an opportunity to share. Hmm. Uh, okay. Otherwise, it's a pretty it's a pretty mundane in, interior. 600 megahertz processor, five megapixel camera, VGA front facing camera. Uh, the Salsa is a 3.4 inch touchscreen phone. The Cha Cha is 2.6 inches. 
portrait phone with a QWERTY keyboard. It'll launch in Europe and Asia by the end of Q2. Uh, AT&C says it will have an exclusive on HTC Facebook phones later this year, although it's not clear if it'll be the cha-cha and the salsa or different models. I'm, I'm just very distracted by the naming conventions here. What is going on? Salsa and cha-cha? Really? I think we're just... We're just running out of names. Yeah. I guess so. It's like URLs on the internet where, you know, we're out of URLs, cars, you know, they're naming cars after strange things now, phones, same thing. I guess so. The, uh, I wonder if I can get the salsa in Verde. <laughs> um. Don't cha-cha on your salsa. You might break the screen. Plus, is, <laughs> do you, is that a big deal for people to have a Facebook button? Is that enough of a gimmick to make people choose that phone? Oh, man. I... <laughs> You know what? You know that what it reminds me of. <laughs> what? It actually reminds me of those keyboards that you could get. That uh, that I'm, I'm I'm imagining everybody thought this because I did. That w have those little customizable buttons at the very top that will make you totally make it so much more useful. That you can mm -hmm. program this to be the web. Oh that right. To be yeah, yeah, yeah. That function, and you never ended up using it. If that you used to be all keyboards. the rage. Yeah. The 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 whole the whole like pulsing Facebook. Pulse Blue. Time right. to share. You can like this and tell your friends. It sounds, I don't know, pushy. The to great me. eye. Yeah, I, I don't want a phone to tell me what to do. Yeah. Right? It is time now to press the blue button. <laughs> press it. Press it. Share with mother. <laughs> share with father. Uh, finally, the HTC Incredible got a refresh as well. Uh, basically, it's three phones got, got a refresh by being called S. I guess they stole that name from Samsung. Uh, the Incredible S will be a 4-inch phone with Android 2.2, only Froyo, uh, gigahertz processor, 720p HD capable, 8-megapixel camera. Really, the Incredible with a little bit of a tweak. Uh, also, the Desire S, 3.7-inch screen. Uh, both of these phones, the Incredible and the Desire, are 800 by 480. Uh, but the Desire now has an aluminum unibody and will come with Android 2.4, gingerbread, uh, according to Engadget, and launched sometime mid Q2. They also uh, announced a new version of the Wildfire, the the more low end Android phone, the Wildfire S with gingerbread. Now, one weird thing about this is HTC uh, put out a press release that accidentally said Android 2.4 gingerbread, uh, and everybody started to speculate that this would be some new numbering system for Google. Mm -hmm. uh, but Eric Schmidt. We'll talk a little more about what he said in his Mobile World Congress keynote. He said that actually gingerbread and honeycomb are going to be merged in the next version of Android, and it'll be called I. So that kind of put to rest all of that speculation. Yeah, I think someone just got confused with numbers. Other, Sorry, did you, you yeah, don't think ahead. it's going to be called icing? It's going to be called ice cream sandwich. Didn't Andy Rubin yeah. already say yeah. that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, because you can't call it ice cream cause because then the statue like will look too much like Froyo. Right. Uh, also at the HTC announcement, a giant floating head of Zuckerberg appeared ah! <laughs> to tell people not to call these Facebook phones. <laughs> ah! That's right. Here we go. Uh, can we? Yeah. Let's play play a little bit of of what the giant so Zuck had to say. Of these new devices that they're announcing today. A lot has been made about a single Facebook phone. But this year, you can expect to see dozens of phones with much deeper social integration than anything we've seen so far. Phones are inherently social devices, and the industry is just beginning to discover what's possible here. In other industries, like games, what we've found is that the companies that build the best social products are the ones that are willing to just jump in and rethink what they're making to be social from the ground up. HTC is doing that here, and that's why social, they're one of the first companies to build a device so with they, deep they, social so essentially, he gets up there to say, I love HTC, but it's not a Facebook-branded phone, and we're not going to do Facebook-branded phones. Tom, you know what that reminds me of more than anything? I think I know, but go ahead. The 1984 ad from Apple. Oh, okay. I was going to say the Bill Gates appearance at Macworld. No, no. 1984 at Apple, and, and I can just see somebody from Google... You know, or, or somewhere from from Twitter or some somewhere else with the big axe running down and going to throw it into the screen and get everybody out well, of their Facebook it, it's trance. The, I, you know, no offense, but it's there you it was go. the sort of performance you'd like to throw an axe at because he's like clearly reading and looking off camera, and that was just was that a Dutch screen? Yeah, that he was. You know, can you like can you, can you make it move away? 
uh, swipe to get rid of Zuckerberg. Right. It, it, it's <laughs> yeah, just totally. that, that was that was. It just seemed so uncomfortable. Uh, another uh, Facebook-related announcement: Jamalto has created a SIM card that will allow you to use SMS functions of feature phones to access Facebook. Kind of a nifty little trick there. And uh, Twitter CEO Dick Costolo backed up the "We're not doing a smartphone" chatter, although he just did it in normal size on stage in person uh but said yeah there's he's like sure we'd like we like twitter to be on every uh mobile platform absolutely but we're not going to do a twitter branded phone well why would they need to i mean twitter has its own official apps um for the iphone a great one for the ipad and there's a variety of other twitter apps that people can use i think twitter there's a certain with. amount of the audience uh for for both twitter and facebook that would get really excited about Ooh, the official phone from Facebook slash Twitter, and I'm going to buy that. I guess yeah, so. Yeah, although uh, imagine having a Twitter button on your phone, and it would probably just be going crazy all day. So I think that would be a little bit of an issue. Would it have to flash green at you? I don't know. Or you know, the thing that I think is interesting blue. on the Twitter side, though, is that they are trying to make it a good experience across all the devices, which I think is really important because I've got a, uh, a BlackBerry, and the, it, the Twitter actually built this app. And it's not very good. So better use of the experience of Twitter on smartphones, I think, is way more important than doing a Twitter phone. Yeah, and Costello did say, we're going to try to standardize things across platforms. So whether you're using the web or a mobile device or an app, uh, you get the same experience of replies and retweets, and that should all work the same way. Because right now, all of that stuff works a little differently depending on how you're using it. Yeah, Jim, I haven't played around with the, the BlackBerry app, but I know that the iPad app, the Twitter iPad app, could not be more different than the web experience, for example, both of which I use the most. Um, and there is there is sort of an issue of, I mean, I guess it's like, oh, it's kind of fun to fire up Grizzly and, and, and tweet that way, but uh, standardization would be, uh, just makes sense. Yeah, it, it, it keeps you from tweeting the wrong thing at the wrong time, which we all know yeah. can be DM devastating. DM fail. Never happens. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> Apple has announced a clarification of their policy regarding subscriptions uh, a couple of weeks after the Daily made its debut as a subscription app. The philosophy is simple, says Steve Jobs in a statement. When Apple brings a new subscriber to the app, Apple earns a 30% share. When the publisher brings an existing or new subscriber to the app, the publisher keeps 100% and Apple earns nothing. All we require is that if a publisher is making a subscription offer outside of the app, the same or better offer be made inside the app so that customers can easily subscribe with one click right in the app. Well, it's th that easy. Th that's, I mean, you've. You, you've spooky. almost convinced me, except that Apple knows that people would rather just not exit out of the app. So they're making it seem like it's like the best uh, answer for the customer. And in a way, it, it is, but it's also the way that they get all the money. All we require is that if we bring the customer, we get our 30%, Sarah. That's all. No, yeah, that, okay. Doesn't that make sense? I, Don't know, we I think, deserve that I much? I do. Yes. Yeah, R see? Well, you've made my life easier. <laughs> This is the revenue sharing Whoa, you've been looking I? for. <laughs> Step out of it. Yeah, so what do you think of this, Jim? Uh, have you had a chance to look over the, uh, the details of this? You know, I looked at it a little bit, and uh, I used to run a magazine, so I, I get a sense of, you know, sub costs. Subscription costs are high. Customer acquisition costs are very high. So if Apple is legitimately bringing customers to you that exist outside of your own customer acquisition efforts, that's fine. But you know what? That's not going to happen because you're going to find it and say, oh, you know, I was out checking something else out. I was picked up a magazine. I was like, hey, I can subscribe to this on Apple. What you're not going to do is go through the direct path that the publisher wants you to go through to subscribe. You're going to just fire up your iPad. You're going to go to the store. And you're like, boom, I want it. Give it to me. And I think that's that's a problem. Yeah, uh, because right now you have to get the customer from the outside and then get them to download the app. That's just kind of the way it works. But you don't want it to work that way if you want the app to succeed. And companies like Netflix, Hulu, are not going to like the idea of putting a subscription button inside their app. But they would be covered by this because they're subscription. It's unclear if something like Amazon's Kindle and the whole Sony e-reader flap is covered by this because that's not a subscription. That's an in-app sale. This is particularly uh, referring to subscriptions, uh, but all of these publishers 
uh, whether they're, they're magazines or, or video services or other, have until June 30th to update their apps to comply with the new subscription guidelines. This is according to a memo leaked by All Things Digital. So I wonder how many will see jump ship, if any. Uh, and certainly this is going to encourage them to want to develop their platforms for Android. Well, here's what I think is going to happen is you're going to see different prices on different platforms. So on Android, for example, it may be $5 a, a month, whereas on Apple, it's going to be 8 bucks a month. But the so Apple policy says that if you have your subscription available at a certain price outside the app, you have to make it available at the same price in the app. Right, but what I mean is, well, yeah, but, but, so wouldn't but that's Apple... just the Apple, the iPad version. I can have a different subscription price for Android and for BlackBerry as I can for Apple. That's not the way this policy reads to really? me, though. It that's says ridiculous. if you make if you make your price available outside the app, it doesn't say where. It says outside the app, you have to offer that same price from within the app. But what if I offer it on the web? What if I have a web uh, offering that's ten bucks a month and an iPad offering that's twelve bucks a month, but they're different? You have I mean, I can come up with a different version. Well, yeah, if if you can prove to Apple that it's different enough, I guess that would work. I mean, let's say I, I'm a magazine, right? PC Magazine, which I used to be editor-in-chief of, which doesn't exist anymore. But let's say I have a paper version. Actually, you know, it's true. They have an electronic version yeah, in fact, they're of the magazine, which, is, yeah. which looks like a magazine. And they have an iPad version and an Android version. How can you say you have to charge the same amount? It's, I, that's I, crazy. I think you're going to see a lot of publishers trying to make these arguments. Uh, and imagine the publishers and the developers, the, the rigmarole they have to go through just to get their app accepted through the App Store already, being like, look, it is different, different color. There's a, there's a box on the right-hand side. It's different, not the well, same. And you know what I would do, and, and this is, in fact, probably what we, we, we will do. If I had a paid version of my product, um, we create free versions, uh, revision three versions, and, and individual show versions for the iPhone, for Android. We just released six show versions for Android. Um, if I ever came up with a paid product, let's say I wanted to give away really high definition or I wanted to have extras or things like that, I would advertise them on the iPhone version and tell people to go to the Android version to get them. A uh, few people in the chat room are pointing out some articles already that Rhapsody is the first one to raise their hand and say, we will not do this. We will not bow to this 30%. Um, I don't know if that hurts Rhapsody more than Apple, but uh, they, they've said, we've issued a statement which says they are not going to play ball. They say, quote, we will be collaborating with our market peers in determining an appropriate legal and business response to this latest development. And a lot of people have come back saying this is antitrust. I don't know if it is, but it certainly has got enough people who know what they're talking about to say it is to cause Apple some trouble. You know, Rhapsody against Apple kind of might not be a fair fight, but Rhapsody and... Ten, Pandora ten of and its Netflix peers. and all those guys, yeah. yeah. Well, and the uh, European Publishers Group are going to be meeting on Monday to discuss what they think of this. And I have a feeling I know what their opinion might end up being. I just wonder how many folks have to say, we're not going to accept this Apple before Apple has to rethink its strategy. It must know already, it, they, must know already that this, is, this would happen. It's just a matter of what the threshold is before they go, okay, 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 let's work with you. I don't think this is antitrust because there is a robust competition. Uh, well, even, even if it's just wait, hold on, Tom. Hold on. What percent of the tablet market does Apple have? Right now, they have over 80 percent, granted. Yeah, you're right. And they have over 80 percent of the market, and they are dictating terms But they're like saying this. just tablets. This doesn't just apply to tablets. It also applies to phones. Right. But if you think about a magazine experience or a reading experience, that's not really a phone experience. It's a tablet experience. I think the tablet market's too young to say that Apple's going to continue to have 80 percent, though. I think I agree with you, but they do now. I think you make a legitimate case that imagine this. Imagine right. Courts when are Internet just that Explorer dumb. was big and Microsoft had it. And if you wanted to do a subscription, you had to have a subscription button and give 30 percent to Microsoft. What would we be saying right now? Well, I would be saying that, you know, there, there are other, there's other competition, but I, I know what the courts ended up saying, so you may be right. that You may be able to trick a court into grading an antitrust thing, but I, I don't think there's antitrust here. We there's not a real monopoly. What, like four new tablets just announced in the last there's two days? tons of new tablets so, coming out. You, I think got, 2011 is going to be... You've got HP be... in the game, you've got BlackBerry in the game, mm -hmm. um, so, and, and there's Windows tablets out there as well. I, I, I don't think that 80% is going to last all the way through the end of the year. I think Apple will still be dominant. I really do. But 
I don't. I really don't. I don't know, Jim. I don't think they have a a, a monopoly position. No. I think eighty percent is a monopoly right now, and I think if you took this to court, you could have a really good case on it. But then again, I'm not a lawyer. Well, if you're mad enough about this that you're going to sell your iPad in protest, you want to sell it to Gazelle because they're our sponsor, and it's the easiest way to get rid of your used gadgets. Uh, even if it's you know, if, even if you're not getting rid of an Apple product, you can you can get rid of your old MP3 players, your laptops, your game consoles. Uh, and we know that you have a bunch of these, and we know you want to buy these new phones and tablets that are getting announced. So the easiest way to get some money for it is go to gazelle.com. You type in the uh, gadget that you have. You, you describe what it is, what condition it is. They will give you a quote for a price. You can print out a mailing label right there, put it in a box, and send it off to them. Or you can even have them send you a box. If you're like, you know what, I don't have the proper box for this thing, they'll send you a box. You put the label on that. Drop it off at the post office, and they will send you your money. You can get it as cash, or you can get it as an Amazon gift card. You get a 5% bonus if you get it as an Amazon gift card. You have them send it to you as PayPal. Uh, they do Walmart gift cards as well. And, they, you know, some examples, e-readers uh, are going for about $100. iPhones have run from $20 to $200, depending on how much you sell them for. MacBooks will get you around $600. You, you got to check, though. You got to go to the website and find out. It's very simple to look it up, find out what they can give you for it. And even if you have such an old gadget that they won't give you anything for it, they'll actually take it off your hands and recycle it responsibly so you don't have it sitting around cluttering up the basement, but you're not worried that it's ending up in a landfill where it shouldn't be. So why not go to gazelle.com, use the bonus code TNT for a 5% bonus on top of what they would normally pay you for it. I've used it. I love it. Try it out. Gazelle.com. We thank them for their support. On to Eric Schmidt. Now, we, we briefly alluded uh, earlier uh, to his announcement. He says the next version of Android will combine gingerbread and honeycomb. He also said they're going to stick to a six-month cycle. Otherwise, he didn't really have a ton of new stuff to talk about. He, he, he showed off a new Android movie studio for honeycomb, so it would allow you to edit videos on your tablet. This looks pretty much like Windows Movie Maker to me, but mm -hmm. on a tablet. Well, the the video editing is, I mean, it's interesting, but, I mean, if it's all sort of touch screen, I don't know. Video editing is really complicated. Um, I, I know I, I haven't been able to, to really um, replicate any kind of experience with video editing on my iPad, but... I don't know. It sounds kind of hobbyish more than it also requires tool. a lot of uh, a lot of processing power. Yeah, and uh, you know if you're taking some nice HD videos and you're trying to really edit them and do a good job with them on you know a one gigahertz processor, even if it is a dual core processor like in the Zoom, it's still going to be a painful process unless you're just doing a couple quick things and then pushing it out. He also uh, said we certainly tried to get Nokia to use Android, and uh, they're still open to the idea. Yeah, actually, Tom, I heard, I mean, I was, I, some people are pretty well informed, told me that they were pretty sure Nokia was going to go Android. So, really? Uh, yeah, and so that's why I was surprised when the Windows announcement came out. So I think it kind of went down to the wire, and I mean, you know what pushed it over the edge, right? The new CEO, X of Microsoft. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's got, he's got buddies. Way. And apparently they only put the Microsoft proposal up for a vote to the board the day before the announcement. They had presented several options one was sticking with what they had one was going with android and the other was going with microsoft but they only put the microsoft proposal up to a, a, a vote to the board and the, and, and the board approved it so yeah you know you got a new ceo you just invested a lot in bringing that ceo in and he's really trying to turn around the company as a board you're not going to be as likely to turn him down on a big strategic decision like that because it is essentially if he got turned down it would have been a no confidence vote in him and they would have had to go out and find another CEO. So, you know, he pushed the issue early on in his CEO ship when he still had the full support of the board. This is going to be a make or break thing for him. And, uh, you know, I hope it gets there. I mean, look, I, I've used a lot of Nokia devices. I've been using the N8. I think the N8 hardware is stellar. Unfortunately, the software that I use from Nokia lately has not been very good. It's buggy. And that, that's the argument, right? Is Windows knows software or Microsoft knows software. So you let them do that software stack, you save some money, you make it popular, it helps Microsoft out, it helps everybody out. Uh, reports coming from Barron's and Bloomberg indicate that AMD may be up for sale and that, in fact, uh, Dell may be interested in buying the chip maker. 
Uh, Barron's reported that recent departures of senior executives like COO Robert Rivett and CEO Dirk Meyer are still unexplained and leading to speculation that folks are abandoning ship in advance of an acquisition, Bloomberg quoted Patrick Wang, an analyst at Wedbush Security, saying there is no management team there. Uh, it sounds far-fetched to me that Dell would buy AMD, but I, I, think it's I think it seems likely that AMD might be putting itself up for sale. You know, I think if you're going to have an acquisition going on, yeah, usually you incent your top managers to stick around until the acquisition is done. So that's a little confusing, but thing about Dell is they are right in the same town. A lot of AMD people know the Dell people. A lot of Dell people know the AMD people. It's all down there in Austin and Round Rock. Yeah. So there's certainly plausibility that the two could get together. And they if you all, think they about all go it, see the Round Rock Express play together. Yeah. Uh, we see a lot of vertical integration happening across the board anyway. Look at HP. HP buys Palm. You know, and, and now they've got an operating system and they've got the hardware platform. Um, HP, you know, H HP bought digital. Remember back in the day when digital had the, they had their own chip group. Yeah. I mean, digital had the alpha. Um, so it's not out of the realm of speculation that a PC vendor would want to have a chip vendor, especially given where Intel's going, you know, trying to do stuff for smartphones and for smart TVs and lots of other things. So there's some strategic value to it, um, but it still is a little bit out there. I mean, do Dell and AMD have a historically good relationship? I mean, have, has Dell been buying from AMD to, yeah. to the point yeah. that it would make sense to just have this be the chip arm of the big company? Intel well, yeah, has been Dell's biggest partner, but Dell mm -hmm. has been more favorable to AMD than a lot of other manufacturers, I feel like. Yeah, and it was a really big deal. I, it must have been 10 years ago or so when uh, Dell finally decided to use AMD parts. Um, and now I think they, they work together and produce a lot of stuff together. So this doesn't sound very far-fetched at all. I just seem, I feel it far-fetched that Dell would pay out to mm. a, what AMD is worth. That, that's, that's what I... I just like the think. visual of no management at AMD right now. It's like, what's, what's happening at lunchtime right now at AMD? Just food fights? Or, yeah. You know, is anyone working? HR people are wringing their hands. <laughs> Why isn't they anyone in charge? to be bought. No one's working. Uh, some actual news, though, is AMD is getting rid of their brand names, Athlon, Phenom, and Sempron. Uh, they're replacing them with new designations of A, FX, and E series, respectively, with the Lano APU occupying the A sector. Uh, quad and Octacore Zambezi chips will get the FX label, and the low-end uh, chips will get the leftover E tag, uh, as reported by Vlad Saval at Engadget. And uh, AMD, did you get an AMD Valentine gift, Jim? No, I'm not on AMD's radar. What'd yeah, you get? They didn't send me one either, but uh, yeah. some other folks reported they got a mug that said, I love APU, and then there was a note uh, talking about how uh, pretty much Intel is breaking your heart. <laughs> I heard that Sandy B broke your heart and wanted to let you know I'm here for you. Is uh, referring to the chipset problems. That's right, right, right. How romantic. Yeah. Lovely. Uh, yesterday, there were a lot of stories around about, about Pandora's IPO. And now that we've had some time to dig through the numbers, some very interesting stuff coming up about the streamer. Uh, the company will offer $100 million in common stock, but despite their revenue of $55.2 million in 2010, they lost money. And a key problem is that they had to turn over 45% of the company's total revenue for the nine months ending on October 31st, 2010 to sound exchange for content acquisition costs. Uh, and Tim Westerberg says we are we are barely getting by in the in the uh, prospectus put out about the IPO. They say there are significant risks. If we can't renegotiate a new deal when this one expires, we might not be able to afford to buy music anymore. Wow. Uh, it's it seems like this is a huge limit on innovation in streaming music space. Forty five percent for the content that you built your company on. Does not seem outrageous to me. Really? Uh, I mean, that's almost yeah. half half your total revenue, not profit. Half your total revenue is being spent on product. That's without paying payroll, infrastructure, or anything like that. But that's your product. Your product is the music. Yeah, but that's that. I don't know. Is that normal? Maybe maybe I'm just unwise in these what? ways. But is it normal to spend forty five percent of your revenue on on one cost? 
Well, so I have been um, watching the uh, NFL football labor negotiations a little bit. And currently, I think the NFL pays the players close to 60%. And a big thing is they want to bring it down to closer to 50%. So there's a business that is making billions and billions and billions and billions that is paying 60% or so for its product. So the problem is, is really that Pandora can't charge enough. To yeah, and their paid model is working but they need to sign more people up for the paid model to actually pull it through. Plus, they need to get more advertising. I think they're working on that as well. Hulu's uh, working on their business model as well. They're uh, getting an art house upgrade by acquiring the Criterion Collection. Criterion Collection, if you don't know, uh, best known as, as sellers of DVDs of some of the greatest auteurs of film history. Uh, Hulu Plus is going to get access to 150 titles right off the bat, things like Kurosawa, uh, Ingmar Bergman. They'll be ramping up to 800 in the coming months. Uh, if you're a Hulu Plus subscriber, you'll get no commercial interruption. Uh, if you are a regular Hulu viewer, they're only going to have a handful of the movies available, and they will have commercials in them. Uh, this is this is essentially a move to get people to want to pay for Hulu Plus. Isn't the Criterion Collection associated with lots of extras and the director DVDs commentary have a lot and stuff of special like that? Features, so that yeah. doesn't really transfer over. I would guess not. No, no. you're just going to get more the library yeah. Yeah. than it is all the special features. But I tell you right now, Hulu's movie selection is crap. So this is a huge injection of quality movies. Oh, a handful of folks on my Twitter feed have already said, okay, so see you next year. Going to watch my Criterion collection on Hulu+. Plus. I'll be watching Rashomon <laughs> Down in my every cave. night for the next well, year. Well, it's interesting to watch them try and build themselves into a Netflix alternative. And I think we're going to see a very interesting battle over the coming years between rights for a lot of different types of media. And you know, Hulu, a company that was built on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, is now adding these upper highbrow films. So who knows? Maybe they're trying to be the highbrow alternative to Netflix, which has everything. What are you trying to say about It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Lowbrow. It's not really Ingmar Bergman. No, well, it's the <laughs> Ingmar Bergman of its genre. Right. Okay. <laughs> they have a very effective use of light. That's why It's Always Sunny. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Somebody is playing chess with the devil, or I mean with death, but it's not in, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. All right, let's uh, move on to the news fuse. Once again, Apple is tangling with jailbreakers. Josh on the Social Apples blog recently discovered that after applying the latest green poison jailbreak code on an iPhone running iOS 421, that is iBooks would not open DRM protected ebooks anymore. Ars Technica reports that the Fair Play DRM scheme uh, test code that uh, test code that should fail on an iOS device, but it may run on jailbroken devices. So if it notices the code runs, it doesn't load the book. Mm -hmm. Digital Times is reporting that Apple may change the screen size of the iPhone to four inches in the next version of the phone, according to upstream component suppliers. The component suppliers noted that the production lines for Apple's next generation iPhone have begun testing, and Apple's interested in expanding the screen size to four inches. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, everybody's got four inch phones at Mobile yeah. World Congress. That would make sense to me. Yeah. A group of Nokia shareholders and former employees has vowed to challenge the new company's annual general meeting in May. The group wants the removal of CEO Stephen Elop and several other new key executives and insists Nokia maintain ownership and control of the software layer of the Nokia products. Shareholder revolt. Nokia revolt. Nokia shareholders aren't the only ones unimpressed by the Nokia Microsoft Strategic Alliance, however. CNET reports Verizon CEO Tony Malone says... He's skeptical Microsoft can meet its goals for Windows Phone, and he doesn't think, quote, Verizon needs the Nokia and Microsoft relationship. Malone said, right now, the three OS players we see for our network are Android, Apple, and RIM. And Motorola Ouch. is getting in on the Windows apathy. I, dare, I, I, call, I stop short of calling it hate. Uh, Motorola's corporate vice president of software and services product management, Christy Wyatt, said that while she would never say never, she doesn't envision Motorola using Microsoft's OS. She said they were disappointed with the timing of features being rolled out and didn't feel they could create value on a closed platform like Windows Phone wow. 7. Wow. Yeah. Wow. A newly formed industry group has proposed a standard that could help eliminate video buffering on mobile devices. Yay! 
Hey, I love this idea. The High Quality Mobile Experience HQME Steering Committee said their P2200 draft standard proposes using local storage and intelligent content caching to relieve network congestion and thus accelerate data delivery to mobile devices. Sprint may yet jump ship from WiMAX to LTE. Senior Vice President of Networks Bob Ozzy said the carrier would study WiMAX adoption rates over the next four to six months before making a firm decision on LTE. Sprint could upgrade its own gear to LTE by swapping in new baseband cards and issuing a software patch. Uh, the same would not necessarily apply to your handset like your Evo, uh, but the transition would take so long you probably want a new phone by then anyway. EA Sports is aiming to help the BlackBerry Playbook live up to the play part of its name. EA Sports. <laughs> it's in the playbook. <laughs> Both Tetris and Need for Speed Undercover will come preloaded on the device in full unabridged versions. The 7-inch rim tablet is set to release in March. Yay, Tetris! Woo! Uh, and finally, uh, Houdini7 in the chat room pointed out a couple links. They just posted on the uh, dev team blog uh, that the Ponage tool has been updated to fix the problem with iBooks. And there's also a Red Snow 0.9.5 B5-4 that fixes the problem with iBooks. So you can't keep the hackers down for very long. The hacks move pretty fast. All right. You guys have uh, been following the George Hotz Sony court battle over the PS3 jailbreak, right? Yes. Jim, mm -hmm. you, you've been following yep. this? Did oh, you yeah. know that GeoHot could rap? <laughs> oh, yeah. No. There is a contest no. for, there's a contest, just one of these remix contests out there that George has decided to enter and rap about his plight. Okay. Oh, my. Yo, it's GeoHot. <laughs> oh, my God. For those that don't know, I'm getting sued by Sony. <laughs> So take us out of the courtroom and into the streets I'm a beast, at the least you'll face me in the northeast Uh, get my ire up, light my fire I'll go harder than Eminem when at Mariah Call me a liar now, it gets a little NSFW after that point. Yeah, kind of love him for this. He's good. He's yeah. Good. yeah. I, I mean, this is... He's... <laughs> He's funny, and he and he and he's really he's referring to the court case because he wants a change of venue, in which he works into the uh, into the rap lyrics. He's getting a message across in a way that many people can relate to. He's calling him out to the streets, and you know what? He's he's not horrible. No, he's no, actually now is, now is he? I, he's obviously he, lip syncing in this video, but is that his voice? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Wow. Yeah, the, the backing track is what the contest uh, provided. And Call me GeoHot. Let's party. Yeah, He's right. cool. <laughs> Jim seems nonplussed, though. Uh, I, I think it's fine. I just like the image of Sarah dating a felon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you don't think he's got a chance of winning this case, huh? No, I, I, I actually don't. I, I don't know, actually. I just think it's been interesting watching the whole thing develop with the, you know, what happened on Twitter and all the other things that people are picking up on. So this is a bizarre case, and I think it'll have a number of twists and turns before it's resolved. For I sure. hope that this is put in as evidence. In the case, yeah. Uh, the the judge kid, is like, "Well, kid, case is settled. You're kids on. got talent." Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I move that we settle this with a wrap off. <laughs> we'll call uh, it jailhouse rap. Yeah, uh, check out the lighted up contest if you want to know uh, why he was submitting this. Uh, besides the fact that it's just pure awesome, on to the calendar. We've got some birthdays. Aww. Today, a very special sixth birthday wish to YouTube. A Happy cute little six. six-year-old. Yeah, just six. Yeah, Lots kinda, of videos. I kind of thought that was a mistake when we were in prep and, and Tom said six years. It's like, really? It seems like longer than that. It I does. feel like the YouTube thing has been longer than six years. It's, I, it's YouTube. I remember it, it was six years ago because I remember at the beginning of uh, 2005, I thought YouTube is such a stupid name. I mean, it really... <laughs> bothered me and now it's just it's so part of my life yeah. i've, wow, I've so i mean I, long ago i man. forgot about yeah. the fact my that i didn't like my the name my sister-in-law introduced me to youtube i was over at her house she's like well have you looked for it on youtube i'm like what the hell is you, you? Right. i had the same reaction you like, know i also used to think that about facebook facebook twitter facebook twitter it's like you just have to get used to it messaging <laughs> electronic mail google docs nintendo wii tcpip <laughs> The internet? <laughs> Super highway. Uh, another birthday. This is a good one. This is a 21st birthday to the EFF. Electronic Frontier Foundation is going to uh, 
Do a little partying of its own, perhaps. Turning 21. Yeah. Partying at a bar. 21. That's, that, that's a, you know, it's a long time. Uh, the Pre-2 is available for $150 through Verizon on fe uh, February 17th. So what are we at here? February... 15th, so two days. All right, two days. Cool. One, 150 bones. New MacBook Pros with Sandy Bridge possibly coming on March 1st. That's the rumor according to a Dutch email. If you believe Dutch emails, With scratchy red lines. Uh, I think I think it's definitely about time for a MacBook Pro refresh. Totally. Whether it'll have Sandy Bridge or not is a different story. Interesting. And we talked about it a little bit before the show, but if you're not aware of our uh, Twit South by Southwest coverage, we're going to be there Saturday and Sunday broadcasting live. So that's uh, March 12th and 13th down in Austin. We're going to record TNT, uh, Twit. Uh, Leo's going to be doing the Tech Guy. We're going to have a meetup. Um, those are all on Sunday. And then on Saturday, uh, Leo and I are actually going to be shooting an episode of iPad today. We're not going to be live because we kind of don't know what the lay of the land is going to be yet. But that, uh, we'll be shooting um, a special episode that we'll release the following Thursday. And we're going to be hitting with our live view, you know, our little jetpack that you guys know and love. We're going to be hitting as many sort of fun events and parties as possible and talking to Jim Louderback and anybody else that we happen to find. Um, well, Jim Louderback, we already know where he's going to be because they're having their big dignation party that Leo crowd surfed last year. So right, we'll have to ask Stubbs, to ourselves Just somehow. so everyone's invited, it's at Stubbs. <laughs> Saturday night, 7.30, show up. It's always fun. I've yeah. been corrected. The uh, email was in Danish, not Dutch, by the way. Ah. Uh, but still they, come see all of us at South by Southwest. The Danes hate that when you get that wrong. We are uh, not Dutch. On to our voice and video mail section. Uh, we got Dave, the IT support manager, sending us a little YouTube video of his own, talking about net neutrality. Hey, TNT, just wanted to let you know I get awfully nervous when uh, Congress starts looking into things they know nothing about, like tech issues and net neutrality. Uh, I think it would be helpful if, uh, before anybody gets elected to public office, they have at least a Network Plus certification. Just an idea. Keep up the good work. Great show. <laughs> not a horrible idea, although maybe not. Maybe just to serve on a committee that would make tech decisions, not to get elected altogether. Right. I think there are some public office positions. Can you imagine like one of those like weird unaccredited colleges being like, get politician certified. <laughs> we need, <laughs> uh, we need more network engineers to run for office. Yes. How about if they know, just know how to set up a Linksys router? Yeah. They just, do they just, it's like, it's like a little test. All right. Set this router up, configure it, open a couple ports, yep. do some port forwarding. Okay. You're elected. Yeah. Get up on BitTorrent and download Gone with the Wind. You're in. I say Dave, Dave, the IT support manager for Congress. Run, Dave, run. Dave in 2012. Uh, to Brendan from Pennsylvania, who gave us a call at 260 TNT Show with his own concerns about net neutrality in Congress. Hey, TNT crew. This is Brendan from Pennsylvania. I was just calling to comment on the uh, situation of net neutrality going to Congress. Um, I don't think any of us would really like the government being involved in net neutrality, but being how it is probably an inevitability, I would rather it be Congress than the FCC. The reason for this is when the government starts doing something I don't really like, I would rather have the privilege of calling my local congressman and complaining about it rather than leaving it to the FCC where there's not too much you can do about it as a citizen. Just a thought. You guys are awesome. Thanks. I we'll think a lot of people later. probably Bye. think the way Brendan does. And the fact of the matter is the reason that the hearings on net neutrality are starting tomorrow on, in Congress is because people called their congressperson and said, I don't like what the FCC is doing. Just because the FCC is doing it doesn't mean there's some like eternal secret organization that can never be touched. They, they are overseen by Congress. So you, you can complain to your congressperson about any federal administration yeah that's part of their job yeah that's uh to take you into consideration that's what's going that's on. why they're your congressperson on to the emails tnt at twit.tv uh our first one comes from andy in raleigh north carolina uh who says hope you caught last night's jeopardy with watson i just wanted to make sure that you made the point that this challenge is not about trivia but about natural language processing. Most of your computer science viewers know very well that natural language is perhaps the most difficult challenge in all of AI. Anyway, it was interesting to see where Watson screwed up 
and what he was good at. Anything with keywords like the Beatles were easy to answer, but the category about decades was not so easy because Watson didn't understand what the answers even looked like. Uh, it did adapt, though. And I, I, it, there was, it was really interesting to watch the coverage and the analysis of this. Did you get a chance to see it, either one of you? I, I did not. I no. didn't, but I'm going to DVR it for, uh, it's tonight and tomorrow, too. Yeah, Watson, tonight yeah. is, Watson's uh, back. is uh, Double Jeopardy and Final Jeopardy from today, from yesterday's episode. And then on Wednesday will be an entirely new round between all of them. It's very interesting, the whole natural language part of it, which I hadn't really taken into consideration because Jeopardy particularly is, you know, they do lots of plays on words that, we kind of, as humans, go, oh, yeah, that's yeah, funny. Right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but a, a, an AI system might just... Whoosh. I would imagine a lot of people probably saw Jeopardy last night. I watched it and, and were like, well, what's the big deal? It's a computer. Of course it's going to get everything right. And probably <laughs> didn't really think of kind of the, the deeper... The well, this computer's not very good. Yeah. <laughs> it got things wrong. Well, of course it's going to win. <laughs> well, and it the, actually didn't the win. Best part, tied, the right? best part was when, uh, I believe it was Brad uh, who said... Uh, an answer, and then Watson said exactly Repeated the same the answer, answer, even yeah. though they had just said it was wrong, yep. because they didn't program Watson to listen to the other contestants' answers. Yeah, it was a fascinating watch. I highly recommend it. It was very cool. Just think how long we've come and how far it, we've come since the computer beat the chess master. I mean, chess is a fairly analytical sort of environment, computational, mm -hmm. you can figure out what's going on. This is an entirely different class of problem, and the fact that Last night was a draw. Mm -hmm. We've come a long way. Absolutely. Our next email from uh, Noel or Noel um, says, "Hey Sarah, hi. Uh, Robocop in Detroit would be a great tourist attraction to a city that badly needs tourist uh, tourism dollars, don't you think? Maybe he really can save Detroit after all." This, of course, is in reference to yesterday's story that there was a Kickstarter project to get a Robocop uh, statue built in Detroit, which has already uh, received quite a bit of donation money. You know what, Noel? Uh, Noel, what a, uh, it's a cool name either way. I think. And dog. I think you make a really good point. Uh, Detroit needs tourism. If there's a Robocop statue, we're all uh, more likely to go and visit and spend a week in Greek town, perhaps, mm. and uh, put a little money back into the uh, downtown infrastructure. Are, are you willing so. to put your money where your mouth is there, Lane? Because, you know, if you say that you will and you don't, Robocop can find you. Oh, you yeah. know, if you pledge $50, they'll buy you a beer next time you're in Detroit. Really? Yeah, that's the reward. I love that. <laughs> I like Detroit. <laughs> Got good food. Yeah. I'm that's in. True. Jim, are you going to pledge? Uh, yeah, I'll go. We're all going to Detroit! Go to Detroit, man. <laughs> I already made my pledge yesterday. <laughs> did you really? Yeah, I did. All right. Um, yes, no, that's a very good point. It's, it's not just about a silly statue. It's about creating interest and bringing people together. Is it DetroitNeedsRoboCop.com? Is that I the... That's yeah, DetroitNeedsRoboCop.com if you want to uh, look into this for yourself and decide if you would like to make a pledge. If for nothing else, but you don't want RoboCop to come after you. Yep. Jim Ladderback, thank you, sir, for being on the show. Really appreciate you uh, being with us. Uh, let people know a little bit more about uh, what's going on at Revision 3 and why they should watch. Sure, revision3.com has lots of great shows. So uh, when you're done watching this and waiting for the next great Twitch show to come on, head over to revision3.com and check out all of our shows, some about technology, some video games, some about how to scam free drinks from your friends at the bar using magic with everybody's favorite magician, Brian Brushwood. And uh, What's your favorite South Revision 3 show that involves counting? Um, you five. know, there's this really cool show. It's called Tom's Top... It's like five, six or 12 five, or seven. Five. Oh, five. That's it. Tom's Top Five is also pretty darn good. Get a room. I hear that's a good show. Yeah, yeah. it is a good show. All right. I, but, I, like, I like every show the same, though. Tom, of course you do. So you know. but, yeah. We're all God's children in Jim's eyes or something <laughs> like that. Thanks, everybody, for watching uh, Tech News Today. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Give us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW, or email us. You can even email us a link to your video call if you want. That's TNT at twit.tv. We will see you tomorrow.
Tom, Sarah, Jason, it's Fatty Mookin. And this is Sea Dog. So, in response to why we think the iPhone rising, they never lift up in height, because Mac is black. Love the show. Peace.